Well, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Chase Hildenbrand, and I'm the student ministries pastor here, and it's been great worshiping with you uh, this morning as we are continuing our series, uh, Christ Community Culture. Each week we've been looking at one of our six values that make us who we are as a church. And this morning we're continuing that series and looking at our value of community. We want to be, we aim to be a family of believers following Jesus that is invested in Christ-centered community. So please join me as we pray to seek God's help in this area. Father, we thank you for this family of believers, Christ Community Church. This morning, may you equip us with your word, challenge us to lean into and invest in the church, your bride. Holy Spirit, mold us more into the image of Jesus Christ for the glory of the Father and for the sake of one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when you hear the word community, I wonder what comes to your mind. Maybe you think about a particular group of people, your coworkers, your, the, the people at school that your kids attend, your lifelong friends, your family, your sports team. Perhaps you view as community as something that just falls into your lap based on a particular life circumstance. Maybe you think about the challenges of community. Relationships are messy. Sin hurts people. And then you think about the time commitment involved in creating and sustaining community. Or the fact that authentic community requires you to be selfless and vulnerable. And when you think about all those things, community can quickly become intimidating. And maybe you think you don't have the time or the energy or the bandwidth to pursue intentional community. Or maybe you're on the opposite end of the spectrum and, and you love community. You think about all the joys that community brings, the camaraderie, the laughter, sharing significant life moments together with a group of people you love. And maybe you have a concept or a dream of community that is ideal and that dream or that ideal inhibits you from creating new community, from embracing new people into your community. Or maybe you've been let down by a community in the past. And in order to protect your heart and your soul, you've determined you will not let it happen again and so you avoid it at all costs. There's many ways in which we associate the word community. And what I want us to consider this morning is that your investment in our church's community is irreplaceable. Your investment within this body, this family of believers is necessary. And will it be difficult? Yes. Especially for introverts, right? Introverts, raise your hand. Yeah, introverts don't like raising their hand. Uh, it's difficult for families with, with young infant babies because nap times and sleep schedules ruin everything, right? It's difficult for families with toddlers because toddlers are crazy. Uh, and then the older your kids get, the more your calendar fills up with piano recitals, soccer practice, football games. There's always the next thing on the schedule. Investing in community is difficult for young singles. It's also difficult for older singles. It's difficult for older couples and empty nesters, for CEOs with demanding jobs, and for those barely struggling to make ends meet. You get where I'm going. We will always have excuses and reasons for not pursuing community within the church. There will be challenges, but if we're gonna take God's word seriously and submit to scripture like Pastor Eric preached on last week, then we better stop making excuses. Investing in community will probably be difficult, but it is and it will be worth it. Think about weightlifters. They don't just magically form big muscles. It's something they work towards. Marathon runners don't just line up the day of the race and run a marathon without training. It's something they have worked towards. And the work is often hard. The work can hurt. The work can be demanding. But the work gets you the desired result. And Christian community is the same way. It's, it is work. But it's good work that produces a good result. God has designed us for community. He has called us to live 
in community. And by his grace, he has given us the church, a community of believers, a spiritual family in which we are to invest in. And so my hope and my prayer is that your love and commitment to our church, this family, would increase today. I hope that you realize that we need you and you need us. Pastor Tony Marita, he writes this in his book, Love Your Church. God has given us a need for community. And he has given us the place where that need for community is met, the church. Sin breaks fellowship with God and with others. But we are reconciled to God and one another through the gospel. God then establishes this unity in Christ. But we do have to maintain it. He gives us a place where we belong. Now we need to commit to belonging. We need to commit to investing. We believe that spiritual growth happens best in Christ-centered community. And we are committed to connecting people into authentic, transforming relationships. And so with that introduction, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. As we look at verses 24 and 25, as we consider what it means to be a church invested in Christ-centered community. I believe you'll find it on page 1007 in the Pew Bible, if you don't have a Bible with you. Hebrews chapter 10. And as you turn there, let me briefly set the context. The book of Hebrews, the overarching theme is the greatness of Jesus Christ. And for nine and a half chapters, we've been getting a steady diet of the supremacy of Jesus, the Son of God. He is better than the law. He is better than the prophets. He is better than the high priest because Jesus alone has made salvation possible. By Jesus' atoning work on the cross and his shed blood, we can have right relationship with God. And then when we get to chapter 10, verse 19, we have this transition marked by the word, therefore. So in light of who Jesus is, in light of all that he has done, the author gives us three exhortations. First, let us draw near, verse 22. Second, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, verse 23. And then third, let us stir one another up, verse 24. And that's where we're camping out this morning, verses 24 and 25. So read with me Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. In light of the greatness of who Jesus Christ is and all that he has done, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. What does it mean to be a church invested in Christ-centered community? Three points of applications in these two verses for us this morning. Stir up, show up, and speak up. Let's look again at verse 24. Stir up. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That word consider there is significant. It's used one other time in the book of Hebrews in chapter 3, verse 1, where the author writes, consider Jesus. That is, think about Jesus. Look at him. Focus on him. Study him. Let your mind be occupied with him. Consider Jesus. And then now here, In 10.24, using that same grammar, we have consider one another. This requires deliberate thought. And so think about giving Christmas gifts. It's almost that time of year to start budgeting and thinking about Christmas gifts. We have two options when we consider giving a gift to somebody. One, we can think about that person deliberately. We can think about what they love, what they enjoy, what would bring them joy. Or we can give them a gift card, right? Which one has more significance behind them? Both are valuable, of course. I love giving gift cards. I have given gift cards. But which gift means more? The one where careful thought is put in. So as we come to corporate worship, as you go to community groups, take the time to consider to really think about the people you will be interacting with and how you might 
stir them up to love and good works. We, we should come to church with an attitude of, of not what can I get, but what can I give? Not how can I avoid as many people as possible, but how can I engage as many people as possible and stir them up? To stir up literally means to incite or to provoke. And so this past week, uh, my dog was uh, stirred up by some javelinas in our front yard as they were eating our pumpkins. And my dog is so old, he can barely bark, but in the middle of the night, I hear a noise. And he is valiantly barking through the window at those javelinas, eating my kids' pumpkins. He was stirred up. Like the javelina did to my dog, we can stir up people negatively. We can incite them. We can provoke them. We can prod and get under their skin until they, their blood boils. But that's not what the author has in mind here. right? Rather, we are to stir up in a good, positive, encouraging way. So because Jesus Christ is king... I want to provoke you into walking in obedience with him. Because Jesus is our only hope, you are to incite me to love and good works. Because we love Jesus and because we love each other, we are not willing to let each other settle in the Christian life. Not only that, but, but we're not willing to let each other drift away. Jesus is too valuable, and so we stir each other up. As the, the calendar has turned to November. In my house, it means outdoor fire pit season. And I love sitting around the fire uh, like I did with my kids last night and the chill in the air. You feel the warm flyer. You have the warm glow you're looking at. And at some point, as you guys all probably know, in the life of a fire, you, you, it starts to die down. And though there's still good wood available for burning, the fire needs some help from an outsider. It needs someone to grab that stick, start poking the fire, and stir it up. And then, right, all the smoke builds as you're stirring up that fire of the wood. And then out of the smoke bursts new flames. That's the imagery that we have here. There's people around you who need to be stirred up. They need to be provoked in love. They need to be prodded along to love and good works. And maybe God intends you to be that person. This isn't just the job of the pastor. It's not just the job of the ministry leaders. It's the job of every single one of us. This can and, and should be done formally, right? We need Sunday school teachers, Stephen ministers, community group leaders, student ministry, small group leaders, who each and every week they are stirring up those under their leadership. But this can and should be done informally. Every single one of us, where you sit today. What if you took the time each week to consider how you might stir up another brother or sister that you know you will see on a Sunday morning? What if you took the time to pray for them and then with them? What if nobody left this place on a Sunday morning without being stirred up and prayed for? We should not attend corporate worship passively. Rather, we are to be ministers, eagerly welcoming those around us, blessing those, seeking to encourage and challenge those around us. To be a church invested in Christ-centered community means that we stir up one another to love and good works. But for the stirring up to happen, we must show up. And so second application, to be a church invested in Christ-centered community, we must show up. Verse 25, don't neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. Evidently, there were some in the early church here that were neglecting to meet with fellow Christians in corporate regular worship. And the author of Hebrews makes it clear, that is a bad habit. To neglect to meet together could leave you liable for discouragement, laziness, selfishness, or even false beliefs. As D.A. Carson reflects in Verses 26 through 30 of Hebrews chapter 10, the author warns of apostasy. And it's implied 
that the people who persistently and deliberately neglect fellowship with Christian believers are in danger of abandoning God himself. So I ask you, how important is the weekly gathering of corporate worship to you? It's important to God. This is not a suggestion, gathering together weekly in worship. It is a command. And I believe this verse is talking about the weekly gathering right here, right now, Sunday morning worship. But I also believe that it's not limited to this. I think it can apply to community groups or discipleship groups, regularly gathering together with believers for worship, prayer, fellowship, the teaching of God's word is vital to our spiritual growth. You see, our salvation, it has both this this vertical and horizontal reality to it. Vertically, we are made right with God. Horizontally, we have fellowship with each other in Christ. The New Testament has no category for Jesus and me, Christianity. The church is the community that God has given us and intends for us to invest in. And this is why we, we encourage and stress and believe in the significance of church membership. Church membership is formalized commitment to one another as believers. By joining a local church, we can fully live out the commands to love one another, to show honor to one another, to serve one another, to bear with one another, to forgive one another, to encourage one another. And there will be a new members class happening again in January for those of you who are interested. Pastor Tim will be leading that. You can ask him for more details. But there's more than just showing up to be together. Verse 25 comes right on the heels of verse 24. We show up so that we can stir up. And so in and out church is not what the author has in mind here. Church is not something we consume, but it's something we contribute to as well. We need to show up so that we can stir up one another to love and good works. This is not a country club where we're served and waited on. Church is not a live stream or a video for you to passively watch. The church is the people of God regularly gathering in a place where we see one another. We learn from one another. We stand shoulder to shoulder and sing praises to our God and King. We read God's word together. We pray together. We breathe the same air. We experience the same things. We listen to the same sermon. We partake of the one bread. In his book, Rediscover Church, Jonathan Lehman, uh, he calls the church embassies of heaven. Some of you have probably been to Washington, D.C., and you've seen Embassy Row. And each embassy is an officially sanctioned outpost of its particular nation within the borders of another nation. And if you were to go to the South Korean embassy and walk inside, you would see the South Korean flag. You would hear the Korean language. You You would get a taste of the South Korean culture. And so Jonathan Lehman writes this in his book. What is a gathered church? It's an embassy of heaven. Step inside your church or ours, and what should you find? A whole different nation. Sojourners, exiles, citizens of Christ's kingdom. Inside such churches, you will hear the king of heaven's words declared. You'll hear heaven's language of faith, hope, and love. You'll get a taste of the end time heavenly banquet through the Lord's Supper. And you'll be charged with its diplomatic business as you're called to bring the gospel to your nation and every other nation. We're an embassy of heaven. And so as you consider what it means to regularly show up here to stir up, let me offer a couple challenges for us to consider in how we show up each week. First challenge, come early and stay late. Come early and stay late. There's a lot of things I love about Sunday morning. One of the, one of the ones at the top of the list is seeing and experiencing the fellowship that happens before and after services here, especially this time of the year when the weather's beautiful, the grass is green, kids are running around, countless people standing outside on the plaza in this room, stirring one another up. And I don't know about you guys, but I've never once 
gotten a lemonade or an Oreo cookie over there without being stirred up by Mike and Charmaine Hennessy. So if you need to be stirred up, grab some lemonade or an Oreo cookie after service. and They'll do it for you. Our fellowship oftentimes comes before and after corporate worship. So don't be late and stay. Don't be quick to take off. Stick around, right? We're not late to sports games. We think very carefully of what time we should leave, right? Where we're going to park, how bad the traffic might be, because we want to be in the stadium when kickoff goes. Do we think that same way with the church, which is so much more important? We will be worshiping. We will be together for all eternity. And we have the opportunity each week to gather with the saints to praise our living God much more important than a football game. I do love football games, though. (laughs) Second challenge, come intentionally. And by this, I mean spend time praying about this gathering before it happens. Pray for others. Pray, Pray for the word to be accurately expounded. Pray for our worship to magnify Christ. Pray for yourself that 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 your soul, that your mind, that your heart would be humbled so that you might be more conformed into the image of Christ. Pray about who you might be needing to stir up. Ask God on Saturday night, who is it, Lord, that you want me to stir up tomorrow morning? Come ready with a posture of worship. Come ready by spending time meditating on the text that is going to be preached. Be active participants in this weekly gathering. Come ready anticipating that there might be fighting in the car on the way to church, right? There's always fighting in the car on the way to church. I think it's because the enemy knows that this is significant and he wants to derail us from it. Coming intentionally means that we're, we're coming here with a plan and a purpose. Who will you seek out? If you know of someone who's hurting, be ready to encourage them. Be ready to love on them. Be ready to stir them up when you see them. Maybe you have on your radar visitors and outsiders and you're intentionally scanning this room during our service and as soon as the benediction is said, you beeline to meet that person because you want them to become a part of this community. Maybe you've been sitting around the same people for weeks or months or years and you don't know much about them beyond their first name. Maybe it's time for you to start intentionally pursuing that relationship. We are a family, and we're a pretty big family, and so it's not realistic that we will all know everybody, but everybody should know somebody. And more than just knowing them, there should be authentic, God-honoring, Holy Spirit-transforming relationships where we are stirring one another up to love and good works. And so if we're not gathering with God's people, we're not simply failing to show up, we're failing to stir one another up to love and good works. And we're failing to encourage one another to persevere in the faith. So that leads us to our third application. What does it mean to be a church invested in Christ-centered community? We stir up, we show up, we speak up. Look again at verse 25, halfway through. Encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Part of the way in which we stir up one another is by encouraging one another. And so the question is, how are we to encourage one another to love and good works? I believe the answer is found in verse 23. Look a couple verses back. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. We encourage one another by reminding each other of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We are commanded to encourage each other because life is discouraging. We've all experienced pain and hardships and frustrations, crushing disappointments. Yet, when our hope is rooted in the faithfulness of God, who always keeps his promises, no matter the circumstances, then we can encourage one another. 
Because though we are weak, he is strong. Though we grow tired and weary, he never does. Though we lack wisdom and discernment, his wisdom is infinite. Though we experience trials and and hardship here and now, this day, he promises that there will be a day where all things will be made new. And these light and momentary afflictions will not compare to the eternal weight of glory. We encourage one another to keep our eyes fixed on Christ and to labor for the sake of the gospel. And we need that encouragement. I remember a time when my wife and I, we had four kids ages five and under. Actually, I don't really remember the time. I just know it happened. (laughs) And I remember asking fathers uh, who were ahead in the journey, uh, further along in the journey with me, uh, looking at them and and asking, am I going to survive? (laughs) You know, how how do you do this? And the general message uh, of their responses was keep your eyes fixed on Christ, right? The Lord will give you strength. Uh, They encouraged me to to intentionally be fathering my kids in that season and not just to let life blow past because a lot of them would say, you know, I would do anything to be in your shoes again. I was encouraged to make sure that I was loving and and caring for my wife. I was encouraged towards love and good works in the middle of that hard season. And every time I would receive encouragement from brothers, it was was like providing a little bit of wind for a couple more weeks to, to push me along, right? This journey of the Christian life. Sometimes not only do we encourage one another by reminding them of God's faithfulness, but also by getting our hands dirty and carrying their burdens with them. In Galatians 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, we read, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In J.R.R. Tolkien's The Return of the King, we have this powerful illustration of burden bearing. And in the climactic scene, when when Frodo is close to completing his task of, of dropping that evil ring in the fire, Yet in that moment, he is overcome with weariness and he's too worn up to make it up the mountain, at which point his loyal friend, Sam, jumps to his rescue and he says, come on, Mr. Frodo, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. And Sam proceeds to help Frodo up the mountain so that the mission can be accomplished. Do you know people in our church family who are hurting May we be a church that, a body of believers that eagerly and quickly seeks to come alongside one another and to carry one another's burdens through the battle. One other way we can encourage each other. We can encourage each other about God's faithfulness, remind each other of God's faithfulness. We can carry one another's burdens. And then a third way I want to propose to you is by singing corporately together each and every week, we can encourage one another. Through our worship, we can encourage one another. Our singing, of course, is first and foremost directed to God, but there is an aspect where our songs are to be directed at each other. They are Christ-exalting and community-focused. We're singing these truths in praise to God, edifying our hearts and minds, and at the same time, proclaiming these truths to each other, edifying others' hearts and minds. And so when we worship, this room doesn't go dark, right? We keep the lights up. Why? So that we can see each other because there's a community aspect in lifting our song and praise to God. And so when we're singing corporately lyrics like we sang this morning, God, pull it up. When I am lost, when I am broken, In the night of fear and doubt, still I will trust in my good Father. Yes, to one great King I bow. And I look across the room and you know that family struggle because one of their loved ones is in hospice or the people sitting next to you are battling cancer or you know about a brother's trial that he's going through that you can't imagine what it would be like to be in his shoes. 
and you see those people with eyes closed, arms raised, singing those lyrics, how is that not encouraging? There is encouragement in corporate worship. We encourage each other by speaking up, by reminding each other of the faithfulness of God by carrying one another's burdens, by singing praises to God in corporate worship. And then verse 25 says that we do this all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day, that's referring to Christ's return. It'll be a day of judgment for some and salvation for others. And we have no idea when that day will be. The early church supposed that it could happen at any time and so should we. And when we adopt that mindset, We'll live life with greater urgency. We'll have a a greater urgency to invest in community. Martin Luther said that there's only two days on his calendar, today and that day. He said, I live today in light of that day. That day should motivate us to be a church invested in Christ-centered community, stirring up one another to love and good works, showing up regularly to corporate worship and discipleship groups, and speaking up, encouraging one another to stay the course. That is a picture of the church and community for the glory of God and for the sake of one another. In his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he writes this, between the death of Christ And the last day, it is only by gracious anticipation of the last things that Christians are privileged to live in invisible fellowship with other Christians. It is by the grace of God that a congregation is permitted to gather visibly in this world to share God's word and sacrament. Not all Christians receive this blessing. The imprisoned, the sick, the scattered lonely, the proclaimers of the gospel in heathen lands stand alone. They know that visible fellowship is a blessing. It is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brethren. So church, look around this room. The brothers and sisters in here, this is all by the grace of God. What a blessing. Are you investing in it? Investing in church community will not be easy but it will be worth it. It is commanded by God, not so that we might feel the burden of the command, but so that we might experience the blessing as we walk in obedience to it. His commands are for our good. So let's be a church that seeks to live this out. Every single one of us, we need each other because of who Jesus is, because of all that he has done and all that he will do. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And sadly, unfortunately, we will fail in this area. We will fail each other. We will disappoint each other. We will be insensitive to each other. We are comprised of a group of redeemed sinners that still sin. The church is messy. Community is messy. But we need to be reminded of the fact that this is just a shadow. This is just a foretaste of our future heavenly community. And because it's messy doesn't mean we pull away. Because it's messy means we engage all the more. This church is a foreshadow. Just like the small little crackers we're about to take in the Lord's Supper is but a foretaste of the great heavenly banquet we will someday experience. And so as we anticipate that day, we live this day, committed to the church, committed to investing in community with our eyes fixed on Christ and with our hearts submitted to scripture and centered on the gospel.